You ready? Okay. Cool. Welcome back. Today we'll be looking at real-time systems. Um, it's a basic introduction to real-time systems and in particular the relevance for operating systems and that will connect up to things we do in SEL4, as you'll see later. So the purpose of this lecture is really two, two um, aspects. That the one is generally give you some awareness of real-time systems, but also uh, give you enough background to understand some of the things we're doing with SEL4 and uh, some of the recent kernel um, additions which we did to SEL4 specifically to support real-time systems. Okay, so I will give a basic introduction into the main concepts and um, ideas of real-time systems after an overview of kind, what, what kind of real-time systems there are and then home in on specific topics that are of relevant to us, the operating systems guys. Um, one is resource sharing, um, sh the other is scheduling particular and overloaded systems, which is a, a real practical thing as you will see. And then finally, a little bit of an introduction to mixed criticality systems, which is the thing that's most relevant to the recent SEL4 work. Okay, so basics of real-time systems. A lot of real-time systems are around us, um, part of everyday life, so from medical devices um, to um, cars, which are of course computer-controlled um, aircraft, etc., including more exotic things like Mars landers and so on. So what makes a system real-time? Any idea what defines a real-time system? It has hard time limits for certain time. Um, that's a specific class of real-time systems called the hard real-time systems, yes. But um, the timeliness is, an imp is the critical aspect, right? There's multiple definitions. Um, the one I like is because it's sort of um, tangible refers to systems. A real-time system is a system that's required to react to a stimuli, to stimuli from the environment, including passage of physical time within a time, within time intervals dictated by the environment. So there is this notion of things happening, certain events, and typically these stimuli in system speak, we call them events. And as it points out, these events can be just the passage of time. So this gives us what's called a time-triggered system. And the others are inter basically interrupts created by some external device, right? It, and of course, passage of time is generally also represented by an interrupt, it's a timer interrupt. So in general, these stimuli map onto um, interrupts. Not necessarily, sometimes you have to pull, etc. But the sort of a, a first approximation is an interrupt happens and then you have a certain amount of time to do something that is, needs, that is required to deal with the interrupt. And um, another definition that goes back earlier uh, Jack Stankovich is one of the gods of real-time systems. Um, real-time systems have timing constraints where the correctness of the system is dependent not only on the results of computation, but also on the time at which those results arrive. So this separates two aspects of correctness. There's the functional correctness, which he expresses here, um, the results of the computation. And then there is the, the tempo correctness, as in delivering them at, by a certain time. So functional correctness is inherently a functional attribute, right? Um, and this is what we most normally worry about in systems, that they are, correct, they are functionally correct, they implement the algorithm they're supposed to. Um, but then there's this important non-functional requirement of um, timeliness. Non-functional requirements are not that rare. There's other non-functional requirements than time. Can anyone think of any? I alluded to that um, on Tuesday, actually. Energy use, right? You may have an energy or a power budget. Um, Power budgets tend to be very important in both um, um, 
systems that are powered by things like solar cells, etc., where you have a limited amount of power available, or high-end data centers where they're just limited by the amount of power they can deliver to CPUs. Um, energy budgets are more important when you have a fixed amount of energy, like a battery-driven device, etc. So these are non-functional properties, just as timeliness. Okay, so the issues then become on the one side correctness, so the system meeting its temporal requirements, whatever they are, and the other orthogonal issue is criticality, and that is what happens if the correctness fails, like we don't deliver on time. And um, in mixed criticality systems, which are indicated, we'll talk about in the end, the two aspects are sort of orthogonal. Okay, and then we talk about different kinds of real-time systems and that basically um, is about the strictness of the temporal requirements. So not the, the criticality, but the, um, the degree to which we need to strictly enforce time limits. And so from, they start with best effort systems over soft and firm and weakly hard and hard real-time systems with increasing strictness of time requirements. And real-time people talk about tasks and jobs, where um, a task is a series of jobs. And in operating system speak, they basically map onto a task being a piece of code and a job, a particular execution of this. So, a, a typical real-time system has this event record structure where you wait on an event to happen, so basically an interrupt to be erased, and then you, in response to that, you do some, some computation. And um, this one of, one of, each one of these computation instances is called a job in the real-time speed. So we have the release is when we receive the event and start processing. And then we have the processing time, which is the execution time of this do job function. And then we have the completion, where when this thing is, has done its job and is ready to receive the next event. So that's pretty straightforward. Um, now, there's a bit more to that because just because the job, the program starts executing in response to the interrupt doesn't mean that's the time the interrupt happens, right? There's some processing before that, the interrupt generally gets caught by the operating system and then handed to the user level. And depending on what else is going on in the system, the, that um, period from when the interrupt is raised until the handler actually starts executing may fluctuate and that's called the release jitter. So the release jitter is the difference between the time when the event happens and the time when the code that's dealing with it starts actually executing. There's also completion jitter, um, which is of course the fluctuation in the time from the event happening until we complete our, uh, complete, uh, <laughs> our computation. Um, obviously release jitter includes Sorry, completion jitter release includes the release jitter. What else would completion jitter include? Why would you get completion jitter that's not completely explained by the release jitter? The processing time for tasks. Of course, yeah, the, the, the processing itself um, may not be constant time. And of course, we all know in general it is not, unless you have a very simple algorithm on very simple hardware. Okay, um, the other concept then is um, in most cases, real-time systems have a, are assumed to be periodic or at least something near periodic and I won't go into details on this here today. Um, but in general, we assume that sort of it's the same event that sort of occurs over and over and each time we have to react to it. And um, that is then encapsulated in this concept of a task. A task is the thing that deals with one particular type of event and a job is the processing each time uh, get, gets triggered by each of these events. And you can see there's different degrees of release jitter here. 
the green arrows are the actual really, um, event time and the uh, blue box indicates when we start processing. And then the important thing in real time system of course is the deadline, right? Um, this is where what expresses the timeliness is the deadline says from the time the event actually ha happens, our processing needs to finish by the deadline. And um, the system tend to have periodic systems, obviously have periodic deadlines. In many cases, the it's typical to start to state the release, sorry, the deadline as relative to the event time, um, which in many cases is a constant, right? So five milliseconds after the interrupt happened, we're supposed to finish processing. And deadlines are very often implicit, meaning the deadline of processing one event is the when the next event happens. So the, that means that the red and the green arrows fall on each other. Now one thing that's frequently misunderstood is real time doesn't mean real fast. As a matter of fact, the time constants of real time, the deadlines, are in most cases fairly lax in the sense of uh, fairly big, right? Um, so if you look at typical thing, pacemakers, its deadline is sort of of the order of 100 milliseconds, industrial processes quite similar, aircrafts are, need to be a bit faster. This is like a commercial aircraft, a um, supersonic fighter jet will be um, even tighter, uh, but still in the milliseconds, airbag, milliseconds, dozens of milliseconds, industrial robot, milliseconds, combustion engine ignition um, is the most critical, uh, the most time sensitive one, which has to react in about two milliseconds. Basically, the rule is in a car engine, the ignition has to be accurate to one degree of the crankshaft. So how come that these deadlines are generally in the millisecond range? Is there any inherent reason for that? And that's really typical. I think they're all just things that are proceeding input really fast. Pacemaker is or you've been a couple times. Um, yeah, I mean, why are they not faster? Why, why are we not talking microseconds? Why are we not talking seconds? Yeah, sure, but w w what's the reason behind that? So the, the general reason is real-time systems, they tend to be real-time because they interact with the physical world. That's, that's sort of what makes them real-time. And it's not surprising that then they operate at time scales that are relevant to the physical world. If you think about phys most physical objects, they sort of change their observable state no faster than in millisecond time scales. So, yeah. Um, for example, if you want to control a robot, well, it, it moves maybe a, f a millimeter or so within a few milliseconds, and therefore that's sort of an appropriate time scale. Um, the car engine, similar, it just, that's, that's the time the crankshaft moves by one degree, um, and, and all this stuff. So, because they tend to relate to events in the physical world or state changes of the physical world, that defines these sort of time scales. And um, then, of course, there's the issue of what happens if we miss a deadline. And you can see we have here single miss consequences, which range between catastrophic and recoverable. For example, a pacemaker, if it misses one beat once a day, you won't even notice it, right? So that's a completely recoverable one. Um, Whereas an airbag, if it doesn't go off <laughs> when it's supposed to, then it's truly catastrophic. Um, and uh, yeah, if, if the combustion engine ignition misfires, it can destroy the engine. Um, and of course, single miss may be a recoverable, multiple rig is not. If the pacemaker just misses all its deadlines or a lot in a row, then the patient dies. Um, similar aircraft, if, if it keeps missing deadlines, then we have a crash. So these things are expressed as criticality, the consequence of failure. This is an example I um, stole from a Siemens document, which is their view of the, the timelines in critical, in, in industrial control systems. So they go from multiple seconds, traffic control, 
right, whether the traffic light switch is a second sooner or later, who cares. Um, simple PLC programming logic, con programmable logic controllers, they're basically embedded computers. Um, they range from here 100 milliseconds to one millisecond. Motion control, so this is in robotics or industrial, or well, basically industrial robotics, 100 microseconds scale. And then if they're really fast, then you're in the 30 microseconds also. And um, so that, that's basically the time scales we're looking at. Okay, so let's look at the different categories of real-time systems, which I listed before. They are distinguished by the time sensitivity, or the sensitivity to the time requirement. So we have the hard real-time systems, and these are where failure is considered catastrophic. So it um, basically, the mission fails if we miss a deadline. Um, and the mission can be keep the person alive, and uh, failure then is obviously pretty bad. So we can look at this as a cost of failure. So there's a cost function, which as long as we deliver things by the deadline, the cost is zero. If we um, fail to miss the deliver by the deadline, then the cost is extremely high. So that's very simple, fast characterization. And then there is, um, so yeah, the, the idea is to miss it. The cost of a miss is catastrophic. And then um, the problem with that is, if in a hard real-time system we have to deliver our computation within a certain maximum latency no matter what, that means we really have to completely understand how long it takes at worst to deliver that functionality. And that's when we get into what's called worst case execution time analysis. So if we look at a typical distribution of the time a particular computation takes, you get this sort of graph. And what's behind this kind of graph or, or this kind of distribution of execution times? And it's not atypical that it's multimodal as this one is shown here. So you have three clear modes of different variants and um, different um, probability. Why do you have this sort of thing? There's really two underlying effects. Which are? The variance with the real life um, events and processing time? Sure. I mean, your processing time in general is data dependent, right? You have, as soon as you have a, um, an if statement or case in your code, then you have data dependent execution path and therefore, in general, a data dependent execution time. So this tends to account for most of the variance. Um, what's the other main effect on variance, which you should be well aware by now? Uh, yeah, but the jitter comes from somewhere, right? Other processing overhead, like uh, interactions with caches. And well, yeah. yeah, sort of architecture um, effects, in particular caching. Um, that lead to an apparent non-determinism. Of course, we know these machines are deterministic, but they often appear non-deterministic in terms of execution latencies because of this microarchitectural state like caches and limited memory bandwidth, etc. So this combination of um, data-dependent execution and um, hard microarchitecture variance gives you the variance of the execution time. And of course, in what you normally, in non-real-time system, what you care about is the average execution time, right? So this would be somewhere, oops, uh, yeah, would be somewhere between those two major modes here. Whereas, of course, in a real-time system where you have to deliver by a deadline, it's the worst case that counts, right? So the, the really the maximum of this, um, this latency distribution. And of course, in general, you don't know what the worst case is. And there is a lot of um, work on techniques for establishing an approximation of the worst case. In most cases, it's, it's impossible to determine the worst case um, because there's just not enough determinism in your, um, in, 
you, you, you have to, ha to approximate your underlying machine too much to, to be completely deterministic. Um, so you, you have to get away with um, approximations. And of course, the approximations are meant to be um, sound, meaning you err on the conservative side. And then you get a worst case execution time, safe upper bound. And what's typical for this, for a lot of real world systems is that the ratio between the worst case and the best case execution time is not in 10 or 20%, but it's often orders of magnitude. Caching will generally not produce orders of magnitude variations in latency, or, although it can, the factor of 10 is quite possible in certain circumstances, but most of that variance is obviously due to um, code depend, data dependent execution path. So, um, <clears throat> Next category is the weekly hard real-time systems. So this is where you're meant to meet your deadlines, but an occasional slip is, uh, is acceptable. Typically because you have a system that can comp compensate for uh, errors. So just imagine you're driving a car, which of course is part of a real-time system. And these days when you drive a car, you're not really in control of the car, right? With your steering wheel and your pedals, you provide input to a controller that controls the car. And um, if you imagine that this controller runs at a rate of sampling rate of say a millisecond or so, um, if occasionally it doesn't process your packet within a millisecond, nothing bad is going to happen. You just, it just misses one um, little turn of the steering wheel and picks it up at next millisecond. So that's, that's a um, an error that's completely acceptable because it's compensated by an outer control loop. And in this case, the outer control loop is the driver. It reacts, the driver reacts to where the car is heading. Um, and often these control loops are actually built into the system. So they're not just humans, but actually part of the overall control. Um, so uh, th these kinds of systems can tolerate an occasional failure of meeting the requirement to meet deadlines because they can compensate for it. So this is where symbolically we have a cost function that's not vertical but fairly steep. So the, the more you miss the deadline or really the more often you miss the deadline the higher the cost. Um, reality is though that if you miss a deadline once it's very hard to convince yourself or an independent authority that this is a one-off and may only happen one of a thousand cases or so. Um, and this is why where, where life sites take, for example, in aircraft, these the certifiers, each, each aircraft needs to be certified by some author, independent authority. And reality is that because it's really hard to make a convincing argument that missing a deadline once is okay and it won't happen too often, they basically treat this as hard real-time systems, so they require you to never miss a deadline, even though the system could compensate for it. And the firm real-time systems, which are basically meeting, failing to meet the deadline is not catastrophic, but it um, reduces the value of the, of the result. And so forecasting systems or high-frequency trading, etc., a good example, right? If you're, a, if you're a high frequency trader and um, you don't deliver your trade by the deadline, you lose money. If it's a, just a tiny fraction, you probably don't care too much because these guys are all too rich anyway. Um, but it, it's, it's a, a basically it's a reduction of quality of service. And of course, weather forecasting is the other good example, right? If you expect your weather bulletin to come in by 4 a.m. and it arrives by 5 a.m., then um, you, you don't really, you have to say fly on old data and something like that. And then there's soft real-time systems and you folks use them all the time when you listen to um, audio or video on your phone. These are me multimedia systems are typical cases of soft real-time system where um, they, they may or may not have actual deadlines. In practice, they do have deadlines because audio processing is a 
um, periodic process, video processing is periodic process, right? You get your screen refreshed, etc. So they also have deadline. If you miss the deadline um, for all, for video, that typically a single deadline miss, you won't notice. For audio, um, you hear, we, we tend to be much more sensitive to missing audio deadlines than video deadlines, and people get upset when they, their audio is um, uh, distorted which is what happens when the deadlines are missed. So it's a stronger sense of quality of service loss. And um, so you have a, again, a um, cost function that increases over time more or less steeply. And a specific kind of um, soft real-time systems are bounded tardiness systems where it's acceptable with some quality of service degradation to miss a deadline up to a certain point, and then after that, the result is useless. And then there's best effort systems, and they are characterized by a very flat cost function, where so you, you don't have a notion of deadlines. In reality, um, very few systems, in very few systems, it doesn't matter at all how late the result arrives. Somewhere, eventually, people get impatient, no matter what it is. Okay, so that, that's the broad characterization of real-time systems. It's mostly so you understand the technology. And then, of course, we are operating systems people. So what does that mean for operating systems? And um, there's the, the classical concept of a RTOS, a real-time operating system, which really, in most cases, means not much of an OS at all. Um, a typical RTOS is just optimized. It's basically a scheduler with some device drivers. Um, so optimized for really fast context switches and classical R tosses have no memory protection whatsoever. Um, obviously, the, the whole point is that their response times are predictable, so they need to be analyzable for worst case execution time, at least in theory. In practice, there's literally thousands of R tosses around. Most of them have never undergone a worst case execution time analysis, so that comes back to the misbelief that real time is real fast. Um, but any RTOS deployed in a safety critical scenario like on an aircraft, they definitely have undergone a worst case execution time analysis. So the basic job is receive an interrupt, design who it is destined for and deliver it real quick. And then schedule the, the task appropriately to uh, the, pro the threats really to deal with that. And um, inherently in this traditional model with no memory protection, etc., basically all code is trusted. In particular, you trust the code to adhere to its worst case execution time. Or put differently, you trust that you have done a sound worst case execution time analysis and that things don't mess with each other and are all well behaved. Which is fine as long as the system is really simple. So if you have a simple microcontroller that controls like a thermostat that takes input from a temperature sensor and then turns the heating on or off. Um, that's pretty easy to do. Of course, it's not a hard real-time system either. Um, but even in hard real-time systems, there, there are a lot of these very simple control functions. Think of the airbag again. Signal comes in, the car is crashing explode the charge to blow up the, um, the airbag, that's a very, very simple control function, right? Chances are this runs on an 8-bit microcontroller, maybe even with um, very little, if probably no operating system at all. Um, I already mentioned this terminology, real-time people talk about task and jobs, where a task is the overall logical activity and the job is one individual release of the task. And um, in operating systems terminology, that the task really maps onto a bit of executable code and a thread that's running it. And the job is the code that, uh, the execution on, in response to a particular um, event happening and then delivering a result. Okay. Um, this should all be very non-controversial and straightforward. Any questions? No? Then let's get into scheduling. 
So if you look at real-time literature, 90% of real-time systems literature is real-time scheduling. And um, not all of that is equally relevant than everything else. Um, some are really, there's some parts of the real-time systems community that's notorious for constructing increasingly sophisticated solutions to oversimplified problems. Um, basically, don't really care about whether these the assumptions they're making match real world systems. There's some really smart people in the real time community that re a lot, a, fi a fair number of them, of course, that, that get it, but there's a fair number of people who just play around with models without any regard to what they really refer to. So what makes real time scheduling a challenge is the fact that time is not fungible. So in when we sort of do other resource management in an operating system, we typically deal with spatial resources, for example, memory management, right? Assigning frames to um, mem physical memory frames to different processes. That job is much easier because to a very good approximation, these frames are fungible. One frame is as good as another, and for a particular post, it doesn't matter which frame it gets. And that's not the case with time. It's not a, as if you just have best effort systems, then again, time is fungible. It doesn't matter which interval of time some process gets. Whereas for real-time systems, it's definitely not. And this is where the challenge comes in. So here's an example. We have two tasks, A and B. And task A needs one slot of time every three uh, time intervals, whereas um, B needs the same overall fraction of time, but it needs three slots every nine intervals. So basically, A has jobs that run for, say, a millisecond, and it, needs, and it has a period of three milliseconds. So every, th every three milliseconds, it has to run something for that takes a millisecond to run and has a deadline of three milliseconds and B has a execution time of three and a deadline of nine. So if these come in at the same time initially, so their re release time is the same, then we, if we schedule A first, then it takes up one slot, leaves two for B, B runs for two slots and then um, a is released again, and if we then um, schedule A, then um, that means we interrupt, we preempt B, run A until it's done, and then run B, and all is fine and everyone is happy. So this is all good. If, however, because they're released at the same time, we run B first, and then let A wait until B is done, then of course A misses its deadline because B runs for the whole time A has to its until its, um, its deadline and therefore it only gets to run when the deadline is over and um, we have a catastrophic failure. And all that by shifting one time interval. And that's sort of the essence of time not being fungible as far as real time systems are concerned. So it matters not only how much time it gets, it matters when you get the time. So that's the non-fungibility non of time, and this is what makes uh, real-time scheduling a challenge. So um, some terminology here. We call a set of tasks feasible if it can be scheduled, basically. If there is an algorithm that will schedule it so everything meets its deadline. and um, if there's different algorithms for doing this, and an optimal one will schedule any feasible time. So you could also say a task is feasible if the optimal algorithm schedules it. So how does this work? Well, there's different ways of running real-time tasks and they're of different sophistication. So the one is the, the classical cyclic executive, and this is what you get in your little microcontroller. Um, so there's four different jobs to run, and they're all their execution sequence is completely predetermined. As a matter of fact, it's hard-coded in here. 
right? So, so we have wait for a tick, then one, one, then run two, run three, etc. And um, so we have this completely periodic schedule that's completely fixed in every respect. And um, obviously, the real-time schedulability analysis that is behind that was done offline and then just hard-coded into the system. Obviously, this only works for really simple systems. Um, what are the drawbacks here? It's obviously not flexible, yeah. What else? Put your operating systems hat on. It, does, it, can't, it can't handle any variance whatsoever, so all of its tasks need to have a more or less fixed execution time. Yes, and what does that mean in terms of timeliness of things happening? Let's say Let's say the environment is not completely deterministic, which is normally the case, right? Um, so an interrupt may come in, and um, let's say this interrupt comes in right at the beginning, and it's destined for job four, job, it's job four's job to handle that interrupt. Obviously, there's a long latency of handling that interrupt, right? The, the worst case latency of any interrupt handling or event handling is the hyper period, so the, the sum of the individual execution times. And that can be fairly long. So um, that's OK in, in many circumstances. But if you think of sort of things like networking, etc., and think of the hyper period being, say, 10 milliseconds, then that might not be the ideal way of driving in Ethernet, because you, you end up probably losing a fair amount of packets. So basically, you have high latencies. Um, theoretically, these um, cyclic executives, and something went wrong with my fonts here, are optimal as long as we can arbitrarily pre preempt, um, meaning interleave the individual executions as you have it here. So T1 runs for a bit and then is preempted by T2, and then we get back to T1, etc. Um, in practice, and, and sort of a lot of real time shaping theory says, yes, OK, it's all because we can just arbitrarily interleave. In practice, you cannot do that because any interleaving obviously costs. We have to preempt something, um, switch some state, etc. So these things are not free. So there, there's, a, there's a limit to how far this can push. In general, it's pretty limited what we, you can do with offline real-time scheduling um, because everything needs to be hard-coded. In general, if you, well, let's independent. Um, there's, there's two ways of dealing with priorities in the system. Priority, by definition, it determines what's done next. And priorities can be fixed or dynamic. And um, if you hear dynamic priorities, you probably think something like the fair share scheduler in Linux. It's way more uh, less complex than that. It's, um, uh, but I'll be getting into examples of this. So if you look at fixed priority scheduling, that means every job has a priority assignment, or in our speak, this is all done by threads that have fixed priorities, and the operating system will never change their priorities. And then you have something like that, where you have a range of, a num a range of priorities, and scheduling simply picks a runnable thread at the highest priority. And um, if you have multiple threads in the same priority, they run round robin. And this is pretty much the um, original L4 scheduling model. The, depending on the system, preemption may or may not be allowed. In L4, always did allow preemption. And um, some systems don't require um, unique priorities. So you know, there's no issue of round robin because there's only one job per priority, et cetera. Um, this all certain real-time theory is simpler if you have unique priorities, um, but that imposes some other restrictions. So, um, important point is that for fixed priority schemes are in many ways simpler 
but they're not optimal. So in other words, those things that you can schedule, but not with a fixed priority scheme. And we'll see examples of that. So of fixed priority schemes, the one generally useful because it is optimal among fixed priority schemes is uh, rate monotonic. And so if you think fixed priorities, generally think rate monotonic. The only reason why you wouldn't have rate monotonic if, if your jobs are not strictly periodic or your deadlines are not implicit. If we have strictly prior periodic tasks and implicit deadlines, then this is the, the way to go. And what it does is simply it assigns priorities inversely to the rates. So the rate is the inverse of the execution time. Um, and that means the shorter your time is, basically the, the inter-release time, the higher the priority. So that's, that's the rate the, at which the releases, the events happen, and um, that rate determines the priority. And the nice thing about rate monotonic, it's got a very simple schedulability test. If you have um, n tasks with periods t1 to tn, then this simple formula where gives you the total utilization. Um, so the, the utilization for each task is its execution time over its period. And the sum of all these utilizations must be less than this simple formula n over uh, n times 2 to the n minus 1 minus n times 2 to the 1 over n minus 1. And if you look, what this means is Obviously, if there's only one job, then yes, utilization you can achieve is 100%. But then it drops very quickly. So for two jobs, you can only um, guarantee utilization, schedulability if utilization is no more than 82.8%. And it then converges to 69.3% log 2. In other words, if you have a system with fixed priority assignment, then you can't guarantee schedulability if the total utilization is above this bound, which asymptotically is log 2. So that's a good number to keep in mind, 70% basically. If, you, if you're willing to throw away 30% of your processor capacity, then you can always schedule things safely with fixed uh, priority assignment. Real-time people get tend to be quite excited about this 70% um, utilization bound, well, it's not optimal, you throw away processor reserves, etc. In practice, um, this is typically not really an issue because um, you have typically enough reserves anyway, and you can, if you do it right, reuse this um, remaining, uh, the, the remaining processor time for background activities which you inevitably have. You have to be careful though of doing that. So, real-time people basically like dynamic priority assignment because you don't have this um, utilization limitation as you get for fixed priority, but in practice I keep show you why there's actually good reasons to stay away in many cases from these dynamic um, priority schemes and really stay with a single fixed priority. Industry will always in ev almost inevitably use rate monotonic because it's a, it's a simple test and it's simply implemented. It has some generally other nice properties which I'll get to later. So what we can say is among fixed priority schemes rate monotonic is optimal but of course in generally it's not because there's cases where things can be scheduled but not with fixed priorities. So here's an example of rate monotonic. So we have three tasks and the tasks have periods of 20, 40 and 80. Of course that means here the rate is 1 over 20, 1 over 40, 1 over 80 and therefore this has the highest uh, priority, there's a medium that's the lowest. And we assume that we have execution times of 10, 10 and 20 units and that gives us utilizations of 50% percent, 
right? 10 over 20 is 50%, 10 over 40 is 25%, 20 over 80 is 25%, overall utilization is 100. And if we schedule that according to the fixed priority, then assume everything is released at the same time, we run the thing that has the highest priority, which is task three, runs for one time unit, then task two runs for one time unit or 10 time units, and then three comes along again and it runs again and finally um, one gets to run. And this actually works, one is then preempted when three comes along again, but in the end uh, for the whole hyper period, everything is scheduled. And it's totally dense because it has to, because our utilization is 100%. So this shows you that rate monotonic, while it's not optimal, meaning it cannot guarantee that something above the threshold can be scheduled, there's cases where things work out. And they're generally cases where the, um, the periods have nice ratios between them, where you basically can bin pack the whole thing densely. So this is a case where that shows that RPM schedulability is a sufficient bound, but not a necessary bound. Okay, so let's look at another um, example where we introduce explicit deadlines. So before the assumptions was deadlines are implicit, meaning the deadline of one release is given by the next release. Now I have here a bunch of explicit deadlines and let's look at how rate monotonic schedules this. Um, we start off at the release time of zero T1, so T1 is the only one that's available at release time at time zero, so we run it for five time units. Then um, T3 is released because it has a higher priority. We preempt T1, run T3, and then it runs for um, 20, sorry, for five time units. So now we are at time 10 and nothing else is released. So we go back to T1, complete its last, uh, co run it for another two units, and then T2 comes along, preempts T1, etc., and um, that's the way it gets scheduled. So the assumption here is, of course, we allow preemption. And um, this is within the schedulability bound, so it actually works out. And so the release deadline, yeah, okay, I just talked over this, um, and lots of preemptions happening. So this is as much as I want to go into fixed priority scheduling. The next thing is uh, dynamic priorities and the, the, the Mercedes of um, dynamic priorities is at earliest deadline first. So earliest deadline will always pick the execute the job whose deadline is closest and will preempt uh, to make that happen. So that means it, it's based, its implementations has a deadline so that release queue, which is fine. Um, the nice thing about EDF is it's actually optimal above everything. So because its utilization bound is 100%. So in other words, EDF can schedule anything that actually fits in the CPU cap capacity. Um, <clears throat> so it's optimal, and if you compare how the scheduling works here, above was the uh, rate monotonic schedule we saw before, and if you do the same task set with EDF, then initially they behave the same, but at then at some stage where in rate monotonic, the newly incoming second release of T3 preempts T1 because it's higher priority. In EDF, the priorities are defined by the closeness of the deadline and here we have T1 is closer to its deadline than T3, so the preemption does not happen. And um, things keep executing and um, both work out. In this case, there's, actually, there's obviously fewer preemptions than um, with rate monotonic. That's actually typical. ADF tends to preempt less than um, rate monotonic, although I'm not sure whether there's an actual theorem about this. But um, yeah, it's um, again, relatively straightforward. 
and if I increase the utilizations here, then um, things happening. Well, we're now in a domain where we cannot schedule this task set with fixed monotonic uh, with fixed priorities anymore. So, in particular, rate monotonic fails. If you play it through, I won't go through it in detail, but eventually, we um, T one is out of luck. It misses its deadline, which is not surprising because our total utilization is above the bound which fixed mono, which rate monotonic promises to be always schedulable, which is in this case I think 82 percent. So we get a deadline violation, which is not surprising because our utilization is higher than the threshold. If we do the same with EDF, then EDF will ha happily schedule that task set which is not surprising because the overall utilization is less than 100% and EDF has a schedulability bound of 100%. So it schedules that one. And that's a really good point for a break. Any questions up to the stage? Nope, good, see you in 10 minutes. Okay, so resource sharing is a fact of life, right? If you have multiple activities on a computer, why would you have them on the same computer if they don't share resources? So it's sort of a in, almost inevitable requirement. And um, real-time systems are no different. So if you take as an example this drone there, um, so this is a military drone um, that um, is obviously a example of a real-time system and it has a control system that so that's the really the real-time part of it and its mission is basically to fly to waypoints take telemetry data um, maybe do nasty things and um, it's flying sort of combination of autonomous and remote control and the way the remote control tends to work is there's um, ground communication which um, interacts with the vehicle's nav navigation system and basically updates waypoints. So the, once the thing is launched, ground control can change where it's going. And that means we have the critical real-time functionality and the not critical ground, ground control communication sharing the important bit of data, namely the waypoints. And of course, the, the, that's really critical because if you um, manage to set the waypoints to go beyond the surface, then the thing will go there. And that's not really what the intention is. Um, so we have the, the, the system where some, and this is actually already an example of a mixed criticality system because the ground control is sort of lesser criticality than the vehicle control. And, um, but the important point is it updates this um, shared data, which needs to be accessed by the vehicle control. And the vehicle control needs to, be, needs to see a consistent state of the shared data. And of course, the shared data is more than a word. Um, the waypoints, they're a complex set of data. And that means there's obviously a concurrency control issue. Right? And as you mentioned, what's the core challenge here about this concurrency control issue? We deal with concurrency control all the time. Why is this a, a new thing for real-time systems? Coherence. Hmm? Coherence. So you've got two different things acting at the same time. Thing yeah, so we, we, we have the usual um, concurrency coherence challenge, but what makes it a different challenge for real-time systems is it interferes with scheduling. Because in the end we have some sort of concurrency control, which means that limits when things can run, right? And that interferes with scheduling. So, introduce scheduling dependencies. Now, how do we do this? 
Um, the, the straightforward thing everyone will probably think of first is we just use locks and uh, we have the shared buffer and there is a, a locking protocol that determines when you're allowed to uh, access the shared buffer, which is all good. Um, what's the possible drawback of this? Um, if the updates take a long time and the people control won't act, have access to the shared buffer. Yeah, um, that's sort of inevitable. But what's what's the challenge of this locking? Something can uh, miss its deadlines just because it's stuck waiting for a resource it needs. Yeah, that, that's that's the inherent shedding problem. Oh, those priority tasks might not be like shedding for a long time. Yeah, it's the same thing. Now, what I'm driving at is, I sort of mentioned this notion of criticality already, right? So, certain things are more critical in the system than others, and that means, in this system, we have to rely on everyone playing nice, basically. The critical bits, which is say client A1, has to rely on the client B to be well behaved and not hog the lock, for example. So um, we need to trust everything to observe the locking protocol. Whether that's a good assumption or not depends on the system, but it's a strong assumption, right? Um, the alternative is we don't let anything directly mess with the shared state but we encapsulate that in a sh uh, sh trusted server. So this is what's called delegation, and um, where in order to access the shared data, you send a message to the server, send me the data back, yes, and um, if the ground communication wants to update waypoints, then okay, it sends a set of waypoints to the shared server, it does updates, presumably with some sanity checking, and then sends uh, replies back, yes, I'm done, right? So this reduces trust in the system from having to trust everything to just having to trust the shared server. And um, depending on your system design, this is my, what you might want to do. In real time speak, this server is called a resource server because it encapsulates a resource, in this case, this shared data of the, the buffer containing the, um, the, the, the waypoints. And how do we implement that in SEO4 world? There's really two ways of doing this. And they have different properties and different use cases. We can either invoke the shared server by IPC. So the, the client, there's two clients accessing the server through the same endpoint. And so the, the client loop would be would contain a call and the call then goes to the server, which is in its usual reply wait point uh, loop, um, receives a request, does the processing, and then replies back, and then the server can continue, the client can continue. And the other model is, so this is a hostile monitor, I'm sure you've heard about that in first year. That's really a, um, a, a monitor with the property that the client cannot ma mess with the, with the monitor, right? The monitor is completely encapsulated. The client is forced to observe the, the protocol. There's no way around. Um, and the other way is to have the server completely asynchronous. Um, so the client, when doing a request, sends a signal to the server. Obviously, they need some shared memory to communicate as well, right? Just semaphores is usually not enough for communication because they don't confer any data. Um, and then the server executes the critical section and when it's done, signals back. And um, this is then your semaphore synchronization and the two basically map onto different scenarios. The whole style monitor makes most sense if everything is on a single core, so client and um, server are co-located on the same core, in which case the, the client has nothing to do while the server is executing anyway. The server will presumably run at higher priority. And uh, so everything is sort of synchronized by design and you might as well use a, a, a real endpoint. Whereas if they are on different cores, then you want to maximize the potential concurrency and use signals. 
And so these are two real standard paradigms for um, these kind of systems depending on whether you expect your server to be on the same core as the client, etc. And uh, some of the properties of IPC are specifically optimized for these use cases. Okay, so this is all fine. Um, but now we have to deal with the fact that, as I said, and as was earlier observed, that, okay, by definition, we have some mutual exclusion protocol here, which means that things get blocked. And that leads to a problem called priority inversion. So let's again have a task set, in this case four tasks, and to make things more, easy, more interesting, we throw in two critical sections, which are accessed by some of these tasks. So task one is only interested in critical section Q, task two doesn't have any critical sections, task 3 has, um, is only interested in critical section V, and task 4 uses both. And the, the, the ordering implies the priority, so task 1 has lowest and task 4 highest priority. So if task 1 starts executing, for a while acquires its critical section, that's all fine, and while it's in its critical section, task 3 comes along, it preempts task one because it has higher priority and then n dots its its own critical section it uses section v the two don't interfere with each other they are separate which is all fine and that would not cause any problems but then um, task four comes along and it executes for a while and then it wants to enter critical section q but it can't because one is in critical section Q, and by definition, it's mutual exclusion. So, task four is blocked. It's higher priority, but it cannot execute. It's blocked out by task one. So, this is a case of priority inversion where the highest priority job cannot run because the lower priority job holds a shared resource, an exclusive resource. So, we. We have nothing else to do for T4, T4 is blocked, so we run the next highest priority job, which is T3, and it eventually gets out of its critical section and um, then finishes executing for now. T4 still can't run because the critical section is still held by T1, which is preempted. T2 comes along, it executes for a while, doesn't need any critical section, just execute until finished. And then finally, we get back to T1, it can keep executing until it's done with its critical section. And then after a long blocking time, T4 finally gets to enter its critical section and, and get to execute, and then perhaps the other critical section finally finished. So there's a fairly long period where the high priority, highest priority job is blocked by mutual exclusion. So that's a um, case of priority inversion. Um, <clears throat> in particular, what you see here is there is a, if you think of how to implement that, there's a long wait chain here, right? Um, four is blocked on one, um, and where one is, this is actually wrong here, um, one is blocked or is preempted by three and then by two, etc. So depend, it's easy to imagine that um, these things can block for a long time. In particular, if T2, which isn't really interested in any critical sections, if it executes for a long time, then in particular, if it has an unbounded execution time, then the blocking time of T4 would be unbounded. And so that's a really bad case of uh, priority inversion. Unbounded priority inversions are deadly, basically. You can't, you'll miss your deadlines. So in this case, the worst blocking time of T4 is, sorry, the second bug in my slides here, and I went through them and didn't notice. Worst case blocking time of T4 is bounded by total worst case execution time of T1 to T3, actually. Sorry about this bug. Uh, 
Okay. Um, questions? So let's make it a bit even more interesting. And um, say, okay, we try to get around this by what's called helping or priority in inheritance. Basically, when T4 is blocked and it's the highest priority, we should do what we can to get it running as quickly as possible. And of course, what's blocking it is T1, which is preempted. And it's preempted because it's low priority. So, the best thing we can do for T4, for our observing our overall priorities, is to make T1 run. Which basically means we have to bump up T1's priority temporarily to 4. So it actually is scheduled and preempts everything else. So then we reduce the blocking time of T4 by the time T1 needs to get out of its critical section. And once it's completed, its um, priority is reset to its original value. And um, T4 is executing as the highest priority job. And then um, its blocking time is much reduced. So, this is, um, we temporarily bump the priority of something blocking a higher priority thread to the priority of the thread it's blocking out. And um, once it's done, then we reverse this priority. So now, let's make things a little bit more interesting um, in having more critical sections acquired and you can see things get complicated. We, we have to do this priority inheritance transitively. So in this case, um, we have we added an even higher priority job 5, which is after critical section V. And so QT4 tried to enter this critical section. So we bump up T1's priority to four and that, so it can execute, but then it gets preempted by the even higher priority five, which is after resource V, which is held by two by then. So it gets preempted and then, now we have to bump up the priority of what, T1, which is holding up everything, right? We have to bump it up to five. So, T1's priority gets bumped twice. First, when it gets preempted, uh, when T4 tries to access the critical resource, and then the second time when an even higher one processes after the same critical resource. And as you can imagine, this develops into an implementation nightmare because with this transitive inheritance, you have to keep a lot of state in order to make this all right. Um, so we have these long blocking chains which are sort of distasteful implementation wise. To make things worse, if we get um, T1 also interested in critical section V while it's holding critical section Q, then we have a mutual de circular dependency and we have a deadlock. So Beyond this complexity, the implementation complexity we have in um, with priority inheritance, and of course implementation complexity always means a it's a challenge to get it right, so there's a great source of bugs, and b it tends to have worst case um, ex a bad worst case behavior. Um, on top of that, it's also prone to deadlocks, so we need to have deadlock avoidance or deadlock detection in the scheme, probably avoidance. So the typical way to do that is by numbering the critical resources and make sure they get ex accessed in order always, um, which of course introduces additional delays because then we would force Q to access Q before it accesses V and so basically complicate things further. So. Um, priority inheritance is nice in theory, some people like it, I hate it because it's complexity and the fact that it can do had deadlock and it's uh, worst case blocking times are actually not good. So 
The alternative is what's called priority ceiling, um, where the idea is that when we, we don't wait for someone else to try to access the critical resource in order to bump the priority, but we associate a priority with the resource itself, and as soon as it's acquired, the holder runs at that higher priority. So the idea is we have a concept of a ceiling priority, where the ceiling priority is the highest priority, plus one actually, of all the tasks that are potentially going to access this critical resource. And we bump up the, as soon as we enter the resource, we bump up its um, priority to that ceiling priority. <coughs> And this is what gives us what's called the Intermediate immediate Priority Ceiling Protocol, or IC, IPCP. So the way this works here is one executes and then acquires critical section Q. And because T4, the highest task in the system, is also after Q, we bump its priority immediately to 4. Well, actually it should be 5 in reality. Um, but so that basically can't be preempted. So then T4, T1 temporarily runs at really high priority. You can say gratuitously because there's no one else there who really wants to get in. Um, but we make sure that the critical section gets released as quickly as possible. And T2 and T3 are blocked while T1 is executing because it's in the critical section. Now that's a sort of unfair to T2 because T2 is not after any critical section at all, as we've seen before. Um, but that's basically the cost we have to pay. And then um, eventually 4 comes along and um, by the time it starts executing, T1 is already out of its critical section because it has been blocked until while T1 was running at highest priority. And then T4, once it's actually running, can run straight through, it gets its critical sections, release them, and is done. So in this case, the, the, the highest priority job is still blocked for a certain amount, but it's actually blocked for the minimum amount of time. Um, so compared that to the priority inheritance protocol, oops, we see that um, the overall execution time is the same because we didn't create or waste any time in the system, we just played with the order in which things get executed. So the total system utilization and the ability to deliver deadlines is not changed. Um, but the, the highest priority job executes for the shorter time. And that sort of makes sense, doesn't it, right? Um, we really want to, that's the, the definition of priority. We want to give the highest priority job the fastest execution and you can see things actually finish, finish in priority order. Now that's of course a construed case and doesn't necessarily be the case, have to be the case. Um, so how do we implement that? Turns out immediate priority ceiling is very straightforward to implement with delegation. So with this um, critical section encapsulated in a server. The challenge is that in order to assign the priorities to this resource server to which we delegate the critical section, um, we need to know the priorities of everything that invokes the server, right? So in, in a general, in an open system where things arrive, come and go, that's not necessarily enforceable. In SEO4, we have the advantage that we need the capability to invoke that server. And so by controlling who gets access to the capabilities for invoking the server, we can actually enforce that rule. Even we could do that even dynamically, right? If we now, if we hand, if the server say has priority four and now a job comes along with priority five and um, it, it, it is given the capability to invoke the server, then at that time we bump up the server's ceiling protocol to five. So, that's the implementation. We have our resource server that runs at the ceiling priority. In this case, I've done it right. It's um, the maximum of its clients plus one. So it can never be preempted by a client. And that's all we need. This is a immediate implementation of immediate priority ceiling. So we don't need any special tricks. The kernel does all the work. 
just by means of the right priority assignments for the shared server. The equivalent with EDF would actually be to the priorities based on the floor of the deadline so that the server is given the shortest deadline of all clients. Um, so immediate priority ceiling, and you can see why I like this. This is really straightforward to implement. It maps nicely onto SEO4 mechanisms. Um, it's provable deadlock free and um, had actually good uh, block, worst case blocking times. The main requirement is that we have the correct assignment of priorities to the shared server, but this is part of the analysis you need to do for the system. And as I said, the need to have a capability in order to invoke the server actually allows us to control that into an SEO4 based system. So there are some other um, priority or locking protocols. Uh, in particular, there's also the original priority ceiling protocol. The one I discussed is the immediate priority ceiling, where we bump up the priority of the critical section immediately when you enter it, or the, the threat entering the critical section. The original priority ceiling protocol deferred that until there was a preemption pending. That increases implementation complexity, as you can see in this graph. Um, it gives a somewhat better worst case bound of priority inversion, but um, in most practical systems that's not worth the effort. It's much easier to just have the simple way where you just implement ICP, I, IPCP by just assigning the priority correctly to the shared server. Um, priority inheritance protocol is worse both in terms of the inversion bound and certainly the implementation uh, complexity. Just non preemptive critical sections, of course, um, have the simplest implementation, um, but a bad in inversion bound. That's about as much as I'm going to say about scheduling theory. This should be all the scheduling theory you need unless you really work on, on real-time scheduling. Any questions up to this point? Nope. Okay, then let's look at a real practical consideration, which is how to deal with overload in real-time systems. So scheduling overloaded systems. What makes a system overloaded? Um, well, it's, it's utilization is over 100% essentially. Exactly, that's the definition, right? Your, your total utilization exceeds 100%, that's an overloaded system. Or, if you do rate monotonic scheduling, the total utilization exceeds the schedulability bound. That's also a case of overload. So, and overload is practically hard to avoid because if you don't want the system overloaded, which is the basic assumption of classical scheduling theory, then you need to know all the worst case execution times. So you need to know safe bounds on all the worst case execution times because in general you can't calculate it exactly. And of course, in average, the worst case execution time, even the precise one is horribly pessimistic because in average, as we've seen in the graph early on, right, where we had these three modes, and the big modes were at the lower time, and that's fairly typical. So most of the time, you don't get anywhere near the worst case execution time, and that's, that's pretty um, typical. So that means, um, you either have to be extremely pessimistic in your assignment of, um, of CPU time, which sort of if you build a big aircraft, then that's, that's a fine thing to do because the cost of your computers is nothing. Um, but increasingly, even in things like aircraft, the so-called um, swap consideration, space, weight, um, and power, uh, really mean that you have to be careful and you can't arbitrarily overdimension things um, because you, you may just not be able to deliver enough energy into the system. Um, you also have to assume that all jobs complete within their worst case execution time. So either assume that or enforce it by the operating system because as soon as one runs for longer, then you over, have overload in the system. And um, everything needs to be trusted to play by the rules basically. So in practice, there's a narrow class of real-time systems where you can maintain these conditions. 
but in practice the majority of the systems you can't really and so that means you really need to be able to deal with overload and basically what you want is a controlled behavior of the system in the in the overload case so and that really comes down in terms of shadling who do who do I kill, right? Who do I force to miss their deadline? So let's look at an example. So this is the example we went through before, where we had the, the system that was schedulable under fixed priority, and we used rate monotonic priority assignment, and everything went fine. There was lots of preemption going on, but in the end, everything is scheduled. All the deadlines are, um, are met. Now, we increase the utilization of the system now to over 100%, so it's definitely not schedulable. So we expect deadline misses. And run the same system again. And what happens? Who loses out? By definition, the lowest priority. Right? That's the, de that's the definition of priority. Um, if the higher priority runs first, and therefore, if anyone miss, meets their deadline, it will be the highest priority job. And by the same token, if anyone misses their deadline, it will be the lowest priority job. So there's no, no secret about that. So it's, that makes it a very predictable behavior. I know if this system goes overload, T1 will suffer, T3 will not suffer as long as there's enough time to just run T3. Okay, so that's an important takeaway. I know exactly who will miss its deadlines in the system. Now let's do the same with EDF, and I specifically picked a utilization that's a above 100%, so EDF can't schedule it either. And I won't go through it in detail. Um, you can believe me that this graph is right. I stole it from a book. Um, and so if we look at what happens is, so things get tied at some stage, and eventually one job misses its deadline. And remember, EDF has dynamic priorities, so it will always keep running the thing with the closest deadline. And that can be anything, depending on when that happened, right? So in this case, the first one that gets hit is T2, so T2 misses its deadline. And then things keeps it executing, and then T3 misses its deadline. And um, if we execute long enough, T1 will miss its deadline. So. In this task set, in overload, any one of the tasks may miss deadlines. And that's sort of bad if you think about it, right? Um, because you really don't know what's going to happen if the system is overloaded. Any of the uh, components may miss their deadlines. And that's why EDF is really unpopular in industry, for good reasons, I think. Because as the saying goes, EDF behaves badly under overload. And as I argued, Overload is sort of a reality in most systems. And this gets me to the last topic for today, mixed criticality system. These are sort of systems where overload is particularly relevant. In basically, overload is either a analysis failure, so you either have your worst case execution times wrong, or you over committed your system knowingly um, or it's a mixed criticality system which is basically where basically is the idea to be able to operate when it's overloaded so and mixed criticality systems are um, now pretty popular basically any autonomous car is a mixed criticality system autonomous uh, vehicles but even non-autonomous standard aircraft the modern ones are all mixed criticality systems um, so what is a mixed criticality system? It's a system that's the same example I've shown you before and I already told you that this is an example of a mixed criticality system. It's um, a system where you have different real-time components. They're all real-time, but the criticality of the failure of these components is different. So in the case of the drone, the control loop is what keeps the thing in the air. If that one fails, then the drone crashes. The ground station communication is clearly less critical because if this fails, then the system will 
not get to see an update to its mission, but it will still be able to achieve the original mission. So this is clearly lesser criticality than the other one. So, um, well, and actually I was talking to the wrong example here. <laughs> um, I wasn't, sorry, I didn't look at my own slide, but it's the same thing applies. So go back to rewind where we are. Um, we talk about the control loop, in this case, the network driver, which is really part of the ground station uh, communication, right? So your network driver is an, in an ethernet that creates interrupts at sort of microsecond frequency, roughly, and the control loop runs at a rate of 100 millisecond, which is um, fairly low. So the, the network has a much higher timeliness requirement, but it's less critical than the control loop. And if you think back, the example I just went through, where we looked at how different jet link algorithms behave on the overload, then we saw EDF is completely seemingly random. It just kills whatever happens to be next to its deadline. Whereas um, fixed priority is sort of more predictable in the sense that it will always drop the lowest priority thing. Now, if we have rate monotronic priority assignments, what are our priorities here? Control loop has a higher priority. Oh no, uh, network has a higher priority because it has to have more packets in. Uh, right. So if we do just plain um, rate monotonic, then the criticality must be aligned with the priority. Because the thing that loses out is the lowest priority thing. So if that's not the lowest criticality thing in the system, then we have a problem. And that's the scenario here, right? With rate monotonic, I give the network driver the highest priority and the control loop a lower priority, but the control loop is more critical and it needs to get its deadline and um, no matter what the driver does. So how do I solve this? We need some form of temporal isolation. So I need to be able to protect the time that's available to the critical control loop, even though there's higher priority stuff running. So you can easily imagine that if I know the worst case execution time of my network driver, for example, and I know, well, network interrupts may come in at microsecond rate, but the driver will not need more than one microsecond to handle one of them, one packet, right? So it will have a utilization of no more than 50%. Uh, the control loop runs every 100 milliseconds for 10 milliseconds. So it only needs a 10% utilization. So in that system, um, it's not overloaded, right? I can safely schedule it. I can allow the network driver to preempt the control loop and everything will be fine, everyone will be happy and uninjured, etc. As long as what's the assumption here? Not overloaded. Well, I just argued it's not overloaded. As long as the control loop still meets its deadline. Yeah. It's the assumption here is that my assessment of the worst case execution time of this network driver is correct. And that means either I need to trust the network driver, and that's what's called a criticality inversion, because now the control loop needs to trust the network driver to play nice. That's not a good situation, right? Um, or I need a mechanism to force the network driver to stay within its declared worst case execution time. Right? So either, either we have tr complete trust or we have give the operating system a big enough stick to stop the network driver from monopolizing the system because by straight priority it has the ability to do that. And this is basically what determines the, um, the design of scheduling context in the version of SEO4 you're playing with and I'll go into that next week. So, Basically, to sum up, in mixed criticality, we have um, the case that something that's running at higher priority is less critical than something that's running at lower priority. So 
the, um, the driver needs to be able to prevent the control loop, but in a controlled fashion. It, we need to stop it from monopolizing. And in general, for things like aircraft that has to go through certification, the requirement here is that we must be able to assure that the critical component operates and meets all its deadline without making any assumptions on the less critical one, because otherwise that would be trusted and it basically it would raise its criticality to the same level and it would have to go through the same expensive process. And the, the point here is getting critical code through certification, airworthiness certification, etc., cetera, um, is an expensive process. So they look very careful at all the code. And your device driver, uh, network driver, and 100,000 lines of code, network stack, etc. you don't want to take through that because pr probably it's, not, it's, it's probably not feasible to get it through and it would be very expensive to do it. So that's the whole point of mixed criticality systems that you have certain things that need to be assured to a high criticality level, a high trust level if you like, because they are highly critical, without making any assumptions about the behavior of the others. And you can only do that with the right operating system support. So um, we need a form of um, temporal isolation. In this particular case, the ability to restrict the, high, the less critical high priority component to what it declares as, as its worst case execution time that goes into the scheduling analysis. So the OS must provide temporal isolation and um, that in the presence of sharing. So this is what makes it tricky, right? Without sharing, it's all pretty straightforward. And um, as I said, I'll discuss how we approach that in SEO4. And I make up for the five minutes overrun of Tuesday by finishing 10 minutes early. Any questions? No? Then... See you next week.